you've had your hand in the creation and development of a number of different technologies, but I think the thing that you're most well known for is the uh, device you're wearing right now, the iTap digital device. So can you uh, tell me how that started, why you wear this device all the time now? Yeah, my grandfather taught me how to weld when I was four years old. And it was an experience that was at once both exhilarating and terrifying. It was terrifying because, you know, you see the world through this dark glass. Everything is almost completely black, except for this little speck of really bright white light. And so I thought there must be a better way. And, and, and so I began to experiment. So I, I had this glass uh, viewfinder, you know, this, this looking glass that you could look into the magnifying glass and see a little miniature television screen, you know, like from a, from a TV camera. And so I mounted it on my helmet. And then I could look at through this glass and I could see through a camera. Fast forward a little bit, in my early childhood, we were one of the first families in our city to have a computer. I connected the computer to this glass. So with a computer on it, I could see the whole world through the glass lightly. You know, originally on a welding helmet or something cumbersome like that, but then by the 1980s, I built it into eyeglass. So I had this eyeglass device that, that, with a viewing glass, with a, a television screen and the computer and the, and the camera system. My, my original vision was to help people see better. Okay. And so I envisioned something of a seeing aid that would be computational rather than just optical. Like the glasses you're wearing are uh, these lenses, you know, that, that bend light. But with this kind of glass, you can see something, and if you put it right up against your eye, like I can read small print, and I can move it with you know an inch or even a centimeter from my eye and still focus on it. Um, and given the, the interactions with people and technology has grown so much more advanced lately with smartphones and the internet and people being constantly connected, has that made it easier for you to convince people of your ideas? In or? some sense. I, I, I mean... 30 years ago, I was the only one walking around with a computer connected wirelessly and you know, constantly online and that sort of thing. 35 years ago, I was trying to justify or explain this glass. I think now digital eyeglass doesn't require convincing. I think people realize its benefits. You have been called a cyborg in the past, and I'm not sure if you've ever applied that term to yourself, but would you consider yourself a cyborg? For whatever the reason, I don't really know why, but I've often been referred to in the media as the world's first cyborg. Manfred Kleins is the fellow who coined the word cyborg, and he's a good friend of mine. And he says, a cy an example of a cyborg is an interaction between human and machine that occurs without conscious thought or effort. And he gives the example of a person riding a bicycle. And that's been around since time immemorial. So in some sense, you know, it's kind of irrelevant because the threshold or definition of cyborg varies so much. I mean, I, I've seen articles that say Steve Mann, world's first cyborg, whatever it is, and I just kind of ignore it. It doesn't really necessarily mean anything. Okay. The idea of always seeing the world through, through an eyeglass, do you think that's frightening to some people? Yes, 28 years ago, yeah. while getting on the uh, subway, I was assaulted by a security guard who was afraid that this thing might be recording him. In more recent cases, you know, when, when somebody has you know, attack me because I, I, I am a camera in a sense, you know, like, like there's this existential notion. When I went to the U.S. consulate to pick up my daughter's passport, at the U.S. consulate, electronic devices are forbidden. But I am an electronic device, you know, my, 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 by my mere being. And so in some sense, I was existential contraband. I've even had people say directly, like TNT Supermarket, said that I wasn't allowed to use a magnifying device to read their labels on their, on their uh, food. You, you know, they have some very fine print, which I magnify it right against my eye. And they said that I wasn't allowed to use that. And the manager actually told me that seeing aids are not permitted in TNT supermarket. And so um, I talked to <clears throat> my lawyer, and my lawyer said, oh, record that. Make sure you record everything so that you can use it in court against them, because what they're doing is illegal. So in some sense, their fear that the cameras might be recording has become a self-fulfilling prophecy out of necessity. Surveillance is a French word. Sur means from above or over, as in surcharge or surtax, and vele means to watch. So surveillance means watching from above. The opposite of surveillance, which this must be, because this thing gets along with surveillance as much as matter gets along with antimatter. 
And so I figure this must be the opposite of surveillance. Well, what's the opposite of oversight? The opposite of oversight is undersight, or in French, surveillance. I sort of thought, well, surveillance, watching from above, they're basically saying, well, we can record you, but you're not allowed to record us. So there's an element of hypocrisy there. So surveillance is the valence of integrity, and surveillance is the valence of hypocrisy. And for the last 50 years, we've lived in a surveillance society. If you go back hundreds of years, or even 100 years, the, the sheriff knew what everyone was up to, but everyone also knew what the sheriff was up to. Enter the sort of more modern society. The police know what everybody's up to, but people don't know what the police are up to. You see, surveillance is a political word. Sur, S-U-R, means from above, and it suggests a ladder or hierarchy of somebody above looking down on the one below. But what we have when we take the sir, when we take the politics off surveillance, we've just got valence. And that, valence is watching. And that's what we used to always have in all the villages that, we, that people grew up in. So we've simply returned ourselves to the global village. Do you hope that one day it'll be um, used to help the visually impaired? Well, 28 years ago, I approached the CNIB, the Canadian National Institute for the Blind, and I showed them this invention, and I said, hey, you know, this, 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 this helps people see better. You know, would you be interested in it? And at the time, they weren't really that interested in it. But eventually, I did uh, get the CNIB to use some of my technology. The technology that they're now using, one of my inventions that's being used by the CNIB, is the hydrolophone. And this invention comes also from my early childhood. My kindergarten teacher told me that there were three kinds of instruments strings, percussion, and wind. Well, strings are one-dimensional solids, long, something long and thin. Percussion is a two-dimensional flat membrane of skin or a three-dimensional bulk solid, and wind is gas. So I said, uh, well, how about an instrument that makes sound from vibrations in liquid? And of course, she said, don't be silly. And everybody else I talked to said it was impossible. And I talked to a bunch of physicists and engineers, and they all told me it's impossible to make a musical instrument that makes sound from vibrations in liquids because liquids are not compressible. And I, I, I thought to myself, well, if liquids are not compressible, then the speed of sound in liquids should be infinity, which it's not. So it sort of occurred to me that liquids are actually compressible, but just not at the scales we normally think of in, in, in human experience. Envision if I built an instrument made out of stainless steel pipes, you know, welded together really strong, that would hold that water and allow it to compress using the infinite force of water hammer. Water hammer is a really destructive force that breaks pipes. And so if we ha have this almost seemingly infinite force acting against this incompressible fluid, we would get something interesting. So thus I invented this instrument that makes sound from vibrations in liquid, something that everybody told me was impossible. One of the things we did is we connected it up. connected it up to this exercise bicycle so that you can do some pedal power. 